It was a year and a half ago in January 2015. I received an email from a retired 60-year-old U.S. Navy petty officer, first-class flight engineer. He asked me to only call him Brian to protect him because he works in an aerospace company today. He entered the U.S. Navy in 1977 and retired 20 years later in 1997 from the military. He and his C-130 crew encountered high strangeness in Antarctica from 1995 to 1996 several times. They all saw rapidly moving silver disks over the trans-Antarctic mountains. Brian and his crew also saw a huge football field-sized hole in the ice only about 5 to 10 miles from the geographic South Pole that was supposed to be a no-fly zone. But during an emergency medevac crisis to speed up their trip, they flew across that no-fly zone and saw apparently what they were not supposed to see. A huge hole in the ice that looked like it was an entrance to an underground installation. Later at camp near Marie Birdland, some dozen scientists disappeared for two weeks. When they reappeared, Brian's flight crew was assigned to pick them up, and all were silent and appeared scared. Brian and his C-130 crew received orders to not talk about the silver disks or the huge ice hole or the missing scared scientists. Repeatedly, the crew was sternly told that they did not see what they kept seeing. Strange, but true stories... Tales from the light side, the dark side, and the other side. I'm Steve White. The famed explorer Richard Byrd covered a lot of ground and explored many places on this planet when it was not an incredibly easy task to accomplish back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. A World War I Navy officer, he claimed to have flown over the North Pole in 1926, becoming the first man to do so though that claim has been in dispute for some time. He was one of the first to try to claim the Ortigue Prize offered to the crew of the first plane to fly nonstop across the Atlantic from New York to France. His effort with his four-man crew was unsuccessful, however, when his plane crashed during the attempt, and Charles Lindbergh flew into the history books, accomplishing the feat a short while later in May 1927 while Byrd's plane was being repaired. His crew eventually accomplished the feat of the transatlantic flight in June 1927. He was applauded and rewarded for his efforts, though rightly overshadowed by Lindbergh's solo accomplishment. Byrd then set off on a different mode of exploration, commanding five different Antarctic expeditions. The first beginning in 1928 and ending in 1930 featured Byrd's documented flight over the South Pole in 1929, the first human to accomplish that feat. The second, in 1934, in which Byrd nearly died from carbon monoxide poisoning during his time living alone in a meteorological station for five months. That incident was said to have affected him the rest of his life. His third exploration of Antarctica was in the pre-war years of 1939 and 1940, in which extensive research of the potential resources available in the Antarctic were conducted. Then, after the war, Byrd was sent back to the Antarctic for a mission codenamed High Jump. It was known about and promoted in the media prior to the expedition, but upon return, the details of it were deemed top secret. The speculation by some being that it was during this time that Byrd may have come in contact with extraterrestrials. Post-World War II, there was concern amongst the U.S. government and allies that the Soviets would attempt an invasion of North America by coming over the Arctic. Naval operations and training exercises had been conducted at the North Pole in 1946, but more was deemed necessary. With the Arctic winter nearly upon them, the U.S. Navy sent 15 ships, including an aircraft carrier, six flying boats, six helicopters, two seaplane tenders, and 13 other aircraft to Antarctica. It was the largest naval expedition ever undertaken in Antarctica. Overkill? Some contend that this wasn't an exploratory mission to find coal deposits, but was in fact an invasion. Wait, what? Yeah, I know, I hear you. Uninhabited Antarctica could be invaded by a lot less, 
say, a couple of guys with rifles and bad attitudes? But again, in the aftermath of World War II, there was a desire to have geographic superiority for defense and quick response. Or was it for another reason? There were rumors circulating in the months after the war ended that many German scientists and military personnel fled to an underground base located in Neuschwabenland, an area the Germans had explored on Antarctica prior to the war. It was a place suspected where Germans were developing an advanced aircraft based on extraterrestrial technologies. With an estimated quarter million Germans unaccounted for after the war, there was a good number of those suspected of making their way to Antarctica. So in that instance, a naval operation consisting of 4,700 men, 15 ships, aircraft, that seems about right, if maybe a little understaffed. Once the naval force arrived at Antarctica, they began reconnaissance of the continent. Byrd was on board the first of the planes to take off on January 29, 1947. Rocket propulsion tubes had been attached to the side of the aircraft, and the aircraft carrier was maneuvered for a 30-knot run to help get the planes airborne. From the vibration of the great carrier, Byrd later wrote, I knew when the captain had got the ship up to about 30 knots. We seemed to creep along the deck at first, and it looked as if we would never make it, but when our four propulsion bottles went off along the sides of the plane with a terrific, deafening noise, I could see the deck fall away. I knew we had made it. Admiral Byrd's team of planes were fitted with the secret Trimetricon spy cameras. They also carried magnetometers, able to show anomalies in the Earth's magnetism, such as if there was a hollow place under the surface ice or ground. The expeditions continued for four weeks, with the planes spending 220 hours in the air, flying a total of 22,700 miles, and taking some 70,000 aerial photographs. On the last of these mapping flights in late February, where all six planes went out, each on a certain pre-ordered path to film and measure, Admiral Byrd's plane returned three hours late. No radio transmission, and the plane feared lost. Once he had returned, it was stated officially that he had lost an engine and had to throw everything overboard except the films themselves and the results of magnetometer readings in order to maintain altitude long enough to return to Little America there on Antarctica. It is during this time that many who have looked into this incident believe this could be the first meeting between Admiral Byrd and representatives of the extraterrestrials and a contingent of the German scientists working on the reverse engineering and construction of flying disks. After that, a mission that was expected to last for between six and eight months came to an early and faltering end. The Chilean press reported that the mission had run into trouble and that there had been many fatalities, though the official death toll was listed as four. The central group of Operation High Jump were evacuated by the Burton Island icebreaker from the Bay of Wales on February 22, 1947. The Western Group left March 1, 1947, and the Eastern Group on March 4, 1947. In the March 5, 1947 edition of a Chilean newspaper, Byrd is quoted in an article titled, On Board the Mount Olympus on the High Seas. He said, It is imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions. I don't want to frighten anyone unduly but that it is a bitter reality that in case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects, which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Post-World War II, there weren't many nations that had the resources to put together that sort of technology. The Soviets may have been the closest with technology and information captured from the Germans during their occupation in the latter stages of the war, but they were still years away. So who, or what was Byrd talking about that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds in the time immediately following his expedition? For a long time, there has been a so-called Admiral Byrd secret diary floating around. The diary told of a flight on February 19, 1947, but over the Arctic, not the Antarctic. Since he was known to be at the South Pole instead of the North Pole at this time, this would be an impossibility. Unless you look at it another way and consider the theory that he managed to travel between the poles assisted, or more likely due in part, to alien technology. The flight diary entry from that day reads as follows. 
We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests grown on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. Encountering more rolling green hills now, the external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading, navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God! Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with perhaps a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible, and we touch down with only a slight jolt. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large, shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on these approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. At this point, the diary tells of meeting with an alien class known as the Arianes, which sounds a little bit too close to Arian for my comfort level. The diary entry continues with Bird apparently talking with someone deemed the Master. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted. But what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return. For there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. He concluded a short time later by apparently saying, We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures. And they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race. Perhaps, by then, you will have learned the futility of war and its strife. And after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With that, Bird and his radio man were ushered out and taken back to their plane, with the words of another saying, 
We must now make haste, Admiral, as the Master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable, and you must return with his message to your race. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until they reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance, guiding them on their return way. Bird says, I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. Shortly after takeoff, the two accompanying aircraft peeled off with a quick message for safe travels, and the control of the plane was returned to Admiral Bird. Five minutes later, Bird and his radio man once again see vast areas of ice and snow, and approximately are 27 minutes from base camp. We radio them. They respond. We report all conditions normal. Base camp expresses relief at our re-established contact. They landed a short time later. An official report was written to cover the three hours the plane was missing, leaving out any details about the supposed visit to meet the Arianes. Several weeks later upon returning to the U.S., Bird had a meeting at the Pentagon in which he told of his fantastic journey. Upon hearing his story, Bird was apparently ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. And outside of his supposed secret diary journaling that day's events, he adhered to those orders. Bird returned to the Antarctic in 1956 as part of Operation Deep Freeze, but was there only a week before returning home. He died at the age of 68 a year later on March 11, 1957. So what do you think? Possible? Far-fetched? This is wide open for speculation and, if you prefer, derision. Tell us in the comments below. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already and sign up for notifications so you know when the next video drops to the channel. Also, check out our website, which has links to our Facebook and Instagram pages. Thanks for watching this video. I'm Steve White. Until next time.